Hello everyone, my name is Robert Hovden and I'm a professor at the University of Michigan. The title of this talk is Room Temperature Stabilization of Commensurate 2D Charge Density Waves in Confined Tantalum Disulfide Polytypes. The goal of this talk is to introduce an approach to synthesizing charge density waves by isolating them in two dimensions and encapsulating them between metallic layers. Before I begin, I'd like to thank the organizers of this IEEE meeting it's my first year attending, and I hope to return in, in person in future years. A lot of effort has gone into validating the system I'm gonna share, which has only been possible through notable contributions from many collaborators that I've listed in the top right of this slide. The work is also presented on Sukyan et al. on an archive paper in uh, just this year. So what, what you're looking at here is an illustration of two-dimensional charge density waves that exist within a mixed polytype structure. These 2D charge density waves exist in the octahedral polytype and they're confined between metallic prismatic layers. And in this heterojunction geometry, hidden ground states occur that wouldn't normally occur at room temperature. Charge density waves have fascinated scientists for many decades, first introduced by Pyrrhus in the 1950s, who showed spontaneous symmetry breaking occurs in a 1D chain of atoms. So the bottom left is a chain of atoms spaced a distance A apart, and above it is a simple band diagram for the valence electrons. The bounds on the Brion zone are inversely related to the spacing between atoms. And what's interesting is, if a small periodic distortion in the lattice occurs, where two atoms move closer to each other, this dimerization of atoms will double the unit cell and shrink the Brion zone to half its size. And at this, uh, one half Brion zone, a small gap opens. For a half occupied valence band, the Fermi level is in the center of this, this gap. So the gap will actually lower the electronic energy states of the system. So there's a competition between the elastic cost of pairs of atoms being squished closer together and the electronic energy gain of breaking symmetry and gapping the Fermi level. It turns out this instability can occur when you cool the system below a critical temperature and the phenomenon is now, now known as the Pyrrhus instability. Pyrrhus himself called this result a surprise for condensed matter physics. It's important to note that both the break in symmetry of the electronic structure, that is the charge density, and also the structure of the crystal, the nuclei, the atoms themselves that are being displaced periodically. In decades following, we discover charge order in the form of charge density waves exists in many higher dimensional materials and behaves much differently than traditional metals or insulators. In higher dimensions, the modulations form a lattice. On the left is a simplified illustration of a charge density wave. It's the periodic blue fuzzy patches, and it's laid atop an atomic lattice, which is shown as little red dots. So we have two crystals, the atomic crystal and this low frequency charge crystal. Just as in the Pyrrhus picture for a 1D lattice, we have atoms that are being displaced here in two dimensions. You'll see this animation of the, the atoms moving towards the blue charge centers. It's exaggerated here, but you can expect in a real crystal that has charge density waves to have distortions of a few picometers. Although the analogy to Pyrrhus is helpful, I'd also note that in higher dimensions, we have a complex Fermi surface and there's no longer a clean analytic description of charge density wave formation. So charge density waves exist in bulk crystals and they've been studied for many decades. There's a large body of high quality research in this field. And I wanna highlight one notable study on charge density waves in a bulk transition metal dichalcogenide that was done uh, by Wilson DeSalvo and others in 1975. Uh, this is a pretty exhaustive manuscript, and I even find modern results be, that are reproducing uh, smaller results buried within this, this work. But this talk is going to focus on tantalum disulfide, which is a two-dimensional or a quasi-two-dimensional layered transition metal dichalcogenide that has complex charge order. Lee and Law have also singled out tantalum disulfide as a candidate for quantum spin liquid if we can realize it in two dimensions. And tantalum disulfide exists in many different polytypes. For example, a 1T phase, a 2H phase, a 3R phase. But if we just consider what's happening within a single layer, only two principal bond coordination, there's only two principal bond coordination. So within each van der Waals layer, there are metal atoms bonded to three calcogenides in the plane above and three calcogenides in the plane below. The prismatic coordination 
which is the illustration below, has calcogenides that lie directly atop each other. And then the octahedral on the top, the calcogenides are rotated 60 degrees and no longer lie on top of each other. And this simple coordination change from an octahedral to prismatic has a dramatic change on the electronic and quantum properties of this material. In the octahedral phase, so the one on the top, charge density waves form. Moreover, structure of the charge density wave changes at different temperatures and drives unique metal to insulator transitions. So here we see in the top, top left, the resistance jumping at two locations due to two changes in the charge density wave phase. However, the octahedral, or sorry, the prismatic structure on the bottom behaves like a simple metal, at least across the temperatures we're interested in. So we see the resistance going down with temperature. Okay, we've come to appreciate that polytypes in chemistry can change the structure of charge density waves. Pressure and temperature is now being used to explore more parameter space. Electric field, magnetic fields have been used to alter or switch charge density wave states. And now we're interested in understanding how dimensionality can change these materials. There's new opportunities afforded by modern tools and nano characterization. So in particular, my lab focuses on high resolution transmission electron microscopy and diffraction based imaging. But also there's this revolution that's happened over the last two decades in fabricating two dimensional materials. So this illustration by you and others shows how the charge density wave phase diagram changes as we reduce thickness. In particular, you see that the insulating phase, uh, commensurate insulating phase, gives way to a conducting nearly commensurate phase. And at the thinnest layers, so once you're down to a handful of layers, um, it, the charge order disappears entirely. So there's flexible tunability between temperature, pressure, chemistry, thickness, electric field, and more. So you'll see this recurring theme in charge density wave systems that disorder destabilizes the charge density waves. Higher temperatures degrade charge densities, defects in the crystal will degrade charge density waves. And as we saw in this figure published by you and others, that reducing dimensionality also degrades charge order. Our work in 2015 showed the same result. We, we noticed that there was oxide layers and adsorbent material on the surfaces of tantalum and disulfide. And we could encapsulate the material in boronitride. And in doing so, we could preserve charge order down to a thinner limit. But as you see here in these resistance versus temperature uh, hysteresis plots, the hysteresis curve widens and gets more metastable. Eventually, the charge order goes away at the few layer limit. So even with encapsulation, we can't achieve two dimensional charge order. So we're left to ask, can we access new states in a clean two-dimensional limit? Is this instability in charge density waves intrinsic to low dimensionality, or is it simply due to extrinsic effects? That is, in two dimensions, the surface becomes highly connected to the bulk. That is, we can't ignore what's happening at the surfaces in two dimensions, especially for complex quantum states. And if we can't ignore the extrinsic environment, maybe we can engineer what that extrinsic environment is. So my lab's been seeking to stabilize charge order in 2D. And in this talk, I'll show a way that not only preserves charge order in 2D, but actually enhances and stabilizes it at higher temperatures. So we're talking about a revision of the phase diagram you're seeing on the left, where hidden ground states emerge in a two-dimensional limit. So let's dig into charge density waves for tantalum disulfide and revisit the cartoon I showed earlier. The blue patches are the regions of high density charge and the red atoms would, re would, would represent the tantalum sites. I'm not plotting the sulfur sites uh, in this cartoon. And you'll notice the charge density wave is ordered, it's periodic, and the charge maxima, that is the center of the blue patches, lies atop the, the center of the tantalum sites. Because the charge lattice and the crystal lattice are locked in with each other, we say they're commensurate. This cartoon would actually represent the low temperature phase in a tantalum disulfide system, which we call the commensurate phase. And also remember that in addition to breaking symmetry in this electronic structure, there's an associated lattice distortion. So the nuclei are being pulled towards the charge centers. And this, this lattice distortion is important because it creates strong signatures in a diffraction pattern. Electron diffraction is quite sensitive to the positions of nuclei. And since it is a reciprocal space measurement, is also highly sensitive to periodicity. 
So the periodic modulations in the lattice produce noticeable super lattice peaks. On the left is a diffraction pattern of the room temperature charge density wave in tantalum disulfide. The brightest peaks are the Bragg peaks. They come from the crystal. And the smaller peaks in between are the super lattice peaks, which come from the periodic lattice displacements of the charge density wave. These charge density wave super lattice peaks have distinct properties from the normal structure. The super lattice peaks get stronger with K, so at higher frequencies, you'll, these super lattice peaks will increase their intensity. And there's also a K dot A term inside of a Bessel function that determines the, the, how the intensity of the peaks change spatially in K space. Um, we've shown that in tensile disulfide, it, it follows the expected longitudinal structure, but in charge ordered uh, manganites, for example, you can see transverse periodic lattice distortions just from the intensities of, in the diffraction pattern. If you want to go through the math of, of, of these diffraction of charge density waves, it was uh, first, first described at Overhauser for a single charge density wave. Wilson did the triple Q, so three charge density wave vectors, and we expanded it out to, to an infinite number of harmonics. So charge density waves undergo phase changes with temperature, and they have distinct signatures that we can see in K space. So at low temperature, we have the commensurate phase. The charge density wave is locked into the lattice. At room temperature, we have a nearly commensurate charge density wave. And at high temperatures, we have an incommensurate charge density wave. I tend to think of these phase transitions as the commensurate phase having long range order, the nearly commensurate phase losing long range order, and the incommensurate phase only having short range order. But the actual specifics of the real space structure is still being debated. For prismatic, um, across these temperature ranges, it behaves as a normal metal. There is, however, at very low temperatures or at lower temperatures, an incommensurate phase that can emerge. But what I want to focus on in this talk is what's happening at and around room temperature, so this nearly commensurate phase. So let's look at a diffraction pattern. We're looking at a diffraction pattern between three Bragg peaks. That's this larger triangle. And you see the super lattice peaks, blue for the low temperature commensurate phase, and red for the room temperature nearly commensurate phase. As you can see, it's called the nearly commensurate phase because the peaks in this diffraction pattern rotate slightly, um, losing the commensuration, but only by a little bit. And here's a, just another picture of the nearly commensurate phase. Now, if we heat this material up well, well into the incommensurate state, and actually right up to the polytype transition, so the temperature where bonds start to restructure in the crystal, and we hold it there for just the right amount of time, what we found is when you cool back down to room temperature, you get an entirely different diffraction pattern. What you're looking at here is a doubling of the number of diffraction peaks from before, and a change in the location of the peaks. These peaks here at the bottom are actually on commensurate lattice sites. So this is dramatically different from the room temperature phase we expect for tantalum disulfide, where the peaks are nearly commensurate and they are half the number as what we see in this, what we'll call later the commensurate twin phase. So here's this twin commensurate phase where we have a doubling of the peaks. We call it a twin commensurate phase because the location of the peaks are commensurate. That is, the charge density lies on the tantalum sites. And it appears in duplicate because we have two coexisting, we have two coexisting charge density waves we have uh, that are degenerate mirror twins of each other. So In order to map the charge density wave structure, that is to understand the nature of these twins, uh, we need to use a pixel array detector. This is a detector that I had the privilege of, of being involved with uh, during my postdoc. It's a, it's a detector that has a million to one dynamic range and allows us to measure Bragg beams alongside single electron sensitivity near and on charge density wave peaks. So we get the intensity of our entire diffraction pattern, and we can do this with using a convergent electron beam, so let's say a half milliradian convergence angle at 200 kilo electron volts, and we can collect a diffraction pattern like the one you're seeing at every beam position as we scan across a large field of view. 
This is part of an emerging technique called four-dimensional STEM. And in this way, we're able to measure local structure with around four nanometer resolution and do it across large fields of view. So for the charge density wave, this means that we can create a virtual detector that selects out the specific peaks corresponding to one of the twins, and we can get a map of where that twin is located. In this case, it's quite boring. We see that the twin exists everywhere. And if we create a virtual detector for the other twin here in pink, we see the same thing. That is, both twins are occurring equally throughout the material. So what we can conclude is that we have twinning occurring out of plane because we're looking at all of the layers in this material in projection, and some of the layers are preferring this alpha twin, and some of the layers are preferring this beta twin, so the blue and the pink. So let's look at what's happening to the material during this thermal process that gives us the twin commensurate phase. So this is a TEM image. It's taken with a high-speed camera, 400 frames per second, of the transition where the T phase, that is the octahedral, is being converted to the simple metallic prismatic phase. And what you're seeing here is one layer converting from octahedral to prismatic. And then new conversions will start at different layers. There's another layer. So the transition, this polytype transition in this transition metal dicalcogenide is not a, a bulk transition that happens all at once but instead you have sort of splashes of conversion um, going from as one layer converts to the other. And we can observe this, watch it, and tune it to the number or the density of layers that we want in the material. So here's some freeze frames of this image, uh, from this movie. You're seeing the two wave fronts uh, corresponding to the bond change in the material. One is a slow direction traveling at about 10 nanometers per second, and we have a fast direction traveling about 100 nanometers per second. And these layers are converting one by one from the octahedral to the prismatic. And we can see that the layers in this video, as they're converting, they're not interacting. So the boundaries here, when, when a new layer starts, doesn't interact with the layer above it. So this, this conversion is happening independently between layers. So again, you'll sort of see this splash. There'll be the fast direction, and then it will, will coarsen out to, to a slow transition along the slower directions. Right. If we look at this material in cross-section, we can really understand and see what's going on. So this is an atomic resolution image of bulk 1T tantalum disulfide. So this is the one that has charge density waves. And after we've thermally cycled it to just the right density, we can get individual charge density wave layers that are now isolated between the metallic layers. So we have two-dimensional charge density wave layers. These are the ones I'm highlighting in blue, sandwiched between layers that do not have charge order. And we believe that these metallic layers are not only decoupling the charge order, so the charge density waves now no longer communicate to each other, but it may also screen out some defects um, or intercalates or whatever is, is happening between the Van der Waals, uh, in the Van der Waals gap. So what we have is a, a new phase, a room temperature phase called, that we're calling the twin commensurate charge density wave, where we have these alpha and beta twins existing in these 2D layers, uh, octahedral layers, in this prismatic octahedral heterojunction. We can look at the electronic properties of the material if we do an electronic measurement by wiring up this material, in this case, it's an in-plane geometry for the bulk tantalum disulfide. So this is a thin flake, but effectively behaving like bulk. We see two uh, phase transitions corresponding to the nearly commensurate and commensurate phase transitions. And if we convert the material to the twin commensurate, we get dramatically different behavior. What you see is a single phase transition happening from the incommensurate to now what is the commensurate phase transition, we see no evidence of a nearly commensurate 
material existing either in diffraction or in our electronic measurements. And um, the material here, the resistance is going down because, again, this is an in-plane measurement, so we're, we've sort of shorted out the material by the metallic layers. But nonetheless, the, the single-phase transition is quite clear. And in SHG measurements, we also see a restoration of mirror symmetry that we expect. So we can understand why we have both alpha and beta twins using a simple phenomenological Landau model. So what we're going to do is imagine that the system has two principal wave vectors described by a double well energy landscape. As we heat it up to high temperatures and we undergo a phase transition to the incommensurate phase, we're in a single well structure, uh, but we're at high temperature. And so we have a blurring of our diffraction peaks consistent with an incommensurate phase. And when we cool back down from this high temperature phase, we go back to a double well but we do, when in doing so, the system will either choose a alpha or it will choose a beta um, orientation. So this energy landscape includes um, also interaction terms between the wave vectors. That is, there's an elastic cost if neighboring Q vectors are too dis dis distant from each other. This is basically a simple XY model just to illustrate how you can kinetically arrive at a single Q vector that's broad coarsening into either uh, alpha or beta twins. And these alpha and beta twins can be degenerate and it will choose with, with even probability one or the other. And we've even repeated these experiments and seen um, that there, are, there is evidence that there's a equal, equal choice between the two. So what matters here is that we have a decoupling of our charge density wave layers so they no longer talk and this this maintains the degeneracy of the two two um, two orientations so this twin commensurate charge density wave uh, lets us go back to the phase diagram we saw earlier where charge order is not predicted to exist in a freestanding 2d layer and we see that by using polytype heterojunctions we can redefine what this phase diagram looks like in the 2D limit, and we have hidden ground states that actually stabilize the insulating phase that is the highly ordered commensurate charge density wave that in a normal system only occurs at low temperatures, but here is occurring in two dimensions at room temperature. So the last thing I want to talk is some new results uh, that discusses what happens at the high temperature charge density wave phase. So that is the incommensurate charge density wave we talked about. This is a diffraction pattern of the incommensurate charge density wave in tantalum disulfide. This matches well-known results where you have blurry first order peaks surrounding your bright Bragg peaks. So these blurry peaks correspond again to short range order in the charge density wave. After we create these endotaxial 2D polytype heterojunctions. That is, once you have the layered structure where charge density waves are interleaved between metallic states, and you look at the same diffraction pattern, what you see is, again, noticeably different. The charge order is much stronger. So let's zoom in on one of these diffraction peaks. This is what I'm showing here. Before, in bulk tantalum disulfide, the blurry peaks are barely noticeable. However, we restore charge order, enhance long range order of the charge density waves at the high temperatures when we do this um, uh, poly mixed polytype heterojunctions. So we can quantify it by fitting parameters in a, a cylindrical coordinate system. So on the left is an experimental image and on the right is our fits. And the same for the polytype heterostructure. We have the experimental and the fit. The distinction is clear, but from the fits, we can also see that the azimuthal broadening goes from 16 degrees down to, down to roughly six degrees. So almost a factor of three uh, change in the full width half max of the azimuthal broadening. The along the radial direction, again, about a factor of three uh, uh, increase in or decrease in the peak size that it that would correspond in real space to a, a lot longer range order and the intensity of the peaks nearly double and this is particularly surprising because we've reduced the number of charge density wave layers 
when we did this polytype conversion, yet the diffraction is much stronger. So we have really a significant increase in both order and amplitude of the incommensurate phase in, in tantalum disulfide. So I'll conclude with that. What we see is a new route to accessing hidden ground states through this clean limit mixed polytype heterojunctions. In this case, we saw that tantalum disulfide changes to a twinned commensurate structure at room temperature. And so restoring the long range order of both the room temperature phase and even the high temperature phase. The work is discussed in our archive paper we just recently posted. We have a long list of, of collaborators that I, I really need to acknowledge here. But in particular, Sukyun Sung, the student who's championed this work and, and put a lot of effort into it. So with that, I will take any questions and thank you for the opportunity to speak to this audience.